You know, I like a slice of onion on my hamburger, and I've been known to eat an onion ring or two, but for the most part, I don't spend a lot of time thinking about onions, but the, the United States federal government does. In fact, onions are the only agricultural product where trading in commodity futures is banned. All has to do with two guys in Chicago and a, a whole lot of onions, and like an onion, the story has a, a lot of layers to it. Onions have played a significant role in human history. According to the National Onion Association, which is not only an actual thing, but describes itself as the Onion Authority, most researchers agree that onion has been cultivated for 5,000 years or more. Since onions grew wild in various regions, they were probably consumed for thousands of years and domesticated simultaneously all over the world. The University of Missouri writes that onions are one of the most ancient of food sources, a staple in the diet of many early civilizations. It was especially important in ancient Egypt, where in addition to being consumed as food, Egyptians worshipped onion, thinking its concentric rings symbolized eternal life. Indeed, the university writes, it was often buried, along with their dead. The website Exploratorium writes that mummies have often been found with small onions placed in their eyes, ears, and next to their bodies. Now, if the thought of burying your loved one with an onion brings a tear to your eye, the National Onion Association notes that onions do have their own charm. Onions may be one of the earliest cultivated crops because they were less perishable than other foods of the time, were transportable, were easy to grow, and could be grown in a variety of soils and climates. Onions prevented thirst and could be dried and preserved for later. Exploratorium notes that Alexander the Great believed that onions increased strength and courage, and so he fed them to his armies. But onions, like many agricultural commodities, are seasonally produced and subject to volatility based on crop production. Thus the argument for futures trading to hedge markets. National Public Radio explained in 2015, Farming is unpredictable, so many farmers count on complicated financial agreements to ensure that they have a steady source of income. In 2021, certified financial planner Hannah Boundy of Sherwood Financial Partners described how the future market is supposed to work. The commodities' derivative markets were born out of a desire from farmers to lessen the uncertainty of growing and selling agriculture by locking in prices. With futures contracts, farmers could lock in the future price of their crop, hedging against the risk that a bad harvest would depress prices or that demand for various products would result in unwanted price volatility. In the United States, Chicago became a natural location for commodity futures trading. In his riveting 1970 work, History of the Chicago Mercantile Exchange, Everett B. Harris, then president of the exchange, writes, In modern history, geography has had much to do with Chicago becoming a world center of commodity trading. The Midwest productive capacities, the processing facilities in Chicago and nearby cities, and the transportation network of roads, rivers, canals, and the lakes, all combined to create a great advantage more than 120 years ago. But our story of the CME does not begin with the humble bulb. Rather, the story of the great onion scandal started with butter. Harris notes that a Chicago product exchange was formed in 1874, which established grades and rules of trading. Kegs of butter were individually smelled and tasted on the spot, and a price was agreed on. Some butter produced in the warm months was heavily salted and stored in basements for later use. The Chicago Butter and Egg Board was organized in 1898, and by 1915, the board had developed 28 rules governing butter grading. Officially founded in 1919 from the Butter and Egg Board, Harris writes that prior to World War II, the Chicago Mercantile Exchange was synonymous with butter and eggs. But the market for butter spread thin following the Second World War, Harris continues. Technological changes had transformed the production and distribution of butter and storage eggs from seasonally produced commodities with classical production and price cycles to basically new and different products in their production, price, and distribution patterns. The economic necessity of hedging markets provided by futures market had greatly diminished. While he notes that a market for futures trading in eggs was preserved by switching to trading in fresh eggs, it became clear that it was a bad idea for the CME to have all those eggs in one basket. It became apparent, Harris writes, that members could not continue to subsist economically on eggs alone. Futures trading in storage butter had almost disappeared, and trading in eggs became tenuous. But the CME survived, Harris explains. 
Necessity is the mother of invention. Beginning in the early 50s and until the present time, exchange members have vigorously researched, tested, and promoted many new contracts for futures trading. Among those, Time Magazine wrote in 2008, were onions. Onion futures launched in the late 1940s were an attempt to replace the lost income, and onions quickly found their place in the market. Loria Listeri explains on the website Earn to Trade, Onion Futures contracts became the most traded product on the CME by the mid-1950s, and in 1955 they made up 20% of the exchange's volume. There was a problem, however, as Time Magazine writes. The struggling Merck remained dominated by a handful of traders, and in 1955 one of those traders decided to corner the market in onions. Investopedia explains the concept. To corner a market means to hold a significant commodity position to be able to manipulate its price. The term implies that the market has been backed into a corner and there is nowhere for the market to move to find other sellers and buyers. The man with the ambition to be the onion king was, Bounty writes, Vince Kasuga. He was an onion farmer growing onions in the Northeast in the 1930s, but he was also a commodities trader, actively trading commodities futures on the Chicago Mercantile Exchange. For a time, Kasuga traded wheat futures, but nearly going bankrupt after a few unsuccessful bets, he then turned to the onion market, with which he was more familiar. Kasuga's quest to obtain an obscene outlay of odorous onions began on his own farm. His nephew, Harvey Paffenroth, told National Public Radio, Well, he was building, it was a big shed of corrugated aluminum. I mean huge. And he had a conveyor in there, and he was filling it with onions. So he was stockpiling all the onions from his farm. But, Listeri notes, his ambition went beyond his own farm. Seeing an opportunity to control the market, he began buying up onions all over the country. But that still wasn't enough, National Public Radio explains. Vince wanted to own all the onions, even the ones that were still in the ground, growing. There's a way to do this. It's called the futures market. When you buy a futures contract, you essentially make a deal with farmers to buy their onions that they haven't even harvested yet. Asteri writes that Kosuga was friends with Sam Siegel, who also traded onions and had a produce company. They thought that by joining forces, they could corner the market in onion futures. By the fall of 1955, they had succeeded. Time Magazine wrote in 1956. Last autumn, Kasuga and Siegel bought 928 carloads of onions, which were shipped to Chicago and stored. This constituted 98% of the onion stocks available in Chicago for onion futures delivery. Paffernoth notes, so he owned all the longs in the future market, and he owned all the onions in the United States, basically. He cornered the market. The scale of the scheme was extraordinary, and the two had stored in the greater Chicago area some 30 million pounds of onions. The Abilene, Texas Reporter News wrote, warehouses all over town were full of their onions, then worth $2.10 a sack. Kasuga became the onion king of Chicago, and having cornered the market, he could set the price of onions. National Public Radio reports Vince Kasuga could charge any price he wanted for onions. And of course, he chose to set the prices very, very high. Vince made a lot of money, but he didn't stop there. The onion king then decided to throw around his weight. The reporter news described what the Commodities Exchange Authority claimed to happen next. Mr. Skasuga and Siegel got in touch with 13 independent onion growers and shippers and asked them, would they like to buy some onions? The Michigander said they wouldn't. They had onions of their own for sale, but the king had leverage. The reporter news continues. Kasuga and Siegel told the onion growers that if they didn't buy those onions, then by the nature of things, a thousand carloads would go on sale and prices would skid. Having inflated the price of onions, the Onion King was now coercing onion farmers to buy onions that they didn't need, or he would release his load of onions and ruin the value of their crop. The two sold, the paper writes, $168,000 worth of onions to onion growers who didn't need them, at prices higher than they had originally bought them for. But at least, allegedly, they had an exchange protected the farmers. Time writes, in return, Kosuga and Siegel promised to hold their onion stocks off the market until March 1956, thus supporting the long side of the market. Kosuga and Siegel had sold their onions at a profit, but farmers were confident that they would recoup their losses in the spring. But the reporter news writes, Kosuga and Siegel continued to deal in onions and also in onion futures. Mostly, they sold short. The website Trade Pro Academy explains what selling short means. 
The idea is you borrow something that you don't have from someone else and then sell it. You will collect the money now, but you are short, missing what you borrowed. You have to return it at some point, and if you can buy it for cheaper later, you make a profit. If it costs more, then you have a loss. Investopedia explains that a trader may decide to short a security where they believe that the price of that security is likely to decrease in the near future. In short, the Reporter News writes, they sold onions they didn't own in the hope of buying their favorite vegetable later at a lower price. Traders, seeing the high onion prices, bought the futures, locking in what they thought was a fair price to buy onions. By February 1956, Time Magazine writes, they held short positions for 1,148 train car lots of onions. NPR explains what came next. And then in March of 1956, Vince sprung his final trap. All those onions he'd been hoarding, he flooded the market with them. Time magazine writes they were engaging in a conspiracy to depress the prices in order to cover their short position in the March onion futures. To grease the price skids, they allegedly shipped some of their aging onions out of Chicago, had them cold, resorted, and repacked, and then sent back to Chicago to make it appear as though large quantities of new onions were pouring into town. As the price fell, the growers were stuck with small mountains of high-priced onions. Listeri writes, prices nosedive from $2.75 to 10 cents per 50-pound bag. Sam and Vincent made huge profits on their shorts. Paffenroth puts the losses suffered by the farmers into perspective. The mesh bag that you put 50 pounds a bag of those onions in, the bag alone empty, cost 20 cents. A 50-pound bag of onions, they went to 10 cents a bag. Farmers were selling their onions, including ones that they had bought from Kasuga and Siegel, for less than the prices of the bag that held them. Time writes, the onion farmers of America were outraged. They'd lost money on their crops as well as on their futures contracts. The two had collected in their shorts more than $2 a bag for onions that were selling for just 10 cents. Paffin Roth writes of his uncle, he made a fortune. He made eight and a half million dollars. That's a lot of money in 1955. Moreover, National Public Radio reports, in Chicago, where the trading happened, the loading docks were piled high with 50-pound bags of onions. Boxcars filled with onions clogged the railways. Traders who were stuck with onions literally couldn't give them away. And they tried. Baffin Ross says they called orphanages, they called hospitals, schools, whatever. They tried to get rid of as many onions as they could, and the rest of them they dumped in the Chicago River. Hauled before the Commodity Futures Trading Commission, Kosuga was defiant, saying, if making money is against the law, then I'm guilty. And in the end, while they couldn't touch the Onion King's fortune, his four trading privileges on the Chicago Mercantile Exchange were revoked. Continued operating his business in New York, where he was generous with his fortune. In 1987, the Middletown, New York, Times Herald Record said of him, his success is the typical story of the American dream come true. That same year, the Middletown Chamber of Commerce named him the Pine Island Citizen of the Year. He passed away on January 19th, 2001, at the age of 86. Outraged farmers called for legislation, and then Michigan Congressman Gerald Ford sponsored the Onion Futures Act to ban the trading in onion futures. NPR notes that it's the only agricultural product that it is illegal to trade futures in. There's still debate over the effect of the act on the volatility of onion prices. National Public Radio's Keith Romer concludes, Without a futures market, onion farmers have a harder time planning out their crops. Onions end up costing us all just a little bit more. Now, you can blame Vince Kasuga for this, or you can blame Congress, but what you can't do is buy or sell a futures contract in onions. It's against the law. The Chicago Mercantile Exchange was devastated by the loss of onion futures trading. The CMA compensated by adding other traded products, including pork bellies and frozen concentrated orange juice. And ironically, it was manipulation of the commodity prices of that frozen concentrated orange juice that was a significant part of the plot of the 1983 film Trading Places. And even more ironically, in 2010, Congress banned futures trading on upcoming motion pictures, something that was pushed by motion picture studios for fear that the success of motion pictures could be too easily manipulated, leading to the odd pairing in 7 U.S. Code, subsection 13-1. No contract for the sale of motion picture box office receipts or onions for future sale shall be made. Gives whole new meaning to the term 
box office stinker. I hope you enjoyed watching this episode of The History Guy. And if you did, please feel free to like and subscribe and share The History Guy with your friends. And if you also believe that history deserves to be remembered, then you can support The History Guy as a member on YouTube, a supporter on our community at Locals, or as a patron on Patreon. You can also check out our great merchandise shop for book a special message from The History Guy on Cameo. 